Section 36 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 36. Selected Excerpts by Jens Bagason, by Anonymous. Jens Bagason, 1764-1826. Jens Bagason was born in the little Danish town Corser in 1764, and died in exile in the year 1826. Thus he belonged to two centuries and to two literary periods. He had reached manhood when the French Revolution broke out. He witnessed Napoleon's rise, his victories, and his fall. He was a full contemporary of Goethe, who survived him only six years. He saw English literature, glory, in men like Byron and Moore, and lived to hear of Byron's death in Greece. In his first works, he stood a true representative of the culture and literature of the 18th century, and was hailed as its exponent by the Danish poet Hermann Wessel. Towards the end of the century, he was acknowledged to be the greatest of living Danish poets. Then with the New Age came the Norwegian, Henrik Steffens, with his enthusiastic lectures on German Romanticism, calling out the genius of Olenschlager, and the 18th century was doomed. Bagesen, nevertheless, greeted Olenschlager with sincere admiration. And when the Aladdin of that poet appeared, Bagesen sent him his rhymed letter from Norden Bagesen to Aladdin, Olenschlager. Bagson was the son of poor people, and strangers helped him to his scientific education. When his first works were recognized, he became the friend and protege of the Duke of Augustenborg, who provided him with the means for an extended journey through the continent, during which he met the greatest men of his time. The Duke of Augustenborg, meanwhile, secured him several positions, which could not hold him for any length of time nor keep him at home in Denmark. He went abroad a second time to study pedagogics, literature, and philosophy, came home again, wandered forth once more, returned a widower, was for some time director of the National Theatre in Copenhagen, but found no rest, married again, and in 1800 went to France to live. Eleven years later he was professor in Kiel, returning thence to Copenhagen, where meanwhile his fame had been eclipsed by the genius of Olenschlager. Secure in the knowledge of his powers, Olenschlager had carelessly published two or three dramatic poems not worthy of his pen, and Bagson entered on a violent controversy with him in which he stood practically by himself against the entire reading public, whose sympathies were with Olenschlager. Alone and misunderstood, restless and unhappy, he left Denmark in 1820, never to return. Six years later, he died, longing to see his country again, but unable to reach it. His first poetry was published in 1785, a volume of comic tales which made its mark at once. The following year appeared in quick succession satires, rhymed epistles, and elegies, which, adding to his fame, added also to the purposeless ferment and unrest which had taken possession of him. He considered tragedy his proper field, yet had allowed himself to appear as humorist and satirist. When the great historic events of the time took place, and overthrew all existing conditions, this inner restlessness drove him to and fro without purpose or will. One day he was enthusiastic over Voss's idols, the next he was carried away by Robespierre's wildest speeches. One year he adopted Kant's Christian name, Emmanuel, in transport over his works. The next he called the great philosopher an empty nut, and moreover hard to crack. The Romanticism in Denmark, as well as in Germany, reduced him to a state of utter confusion. But in spite of this, he continued a child of the old order, which was already doomed. And with all his unrest and discord, he remained, nevertheless, the champion of form, the poet of the graces, as he has been called. This gift of form 
has given him his literary importance. He built a bridge from the 18th to the 19th century, and when the new romantic school overstepped its privileges, it was he who called it to order. The most conspicuous act of his literary life was the controversy with Olenschlager, and the wittiest product of his pen is the reckless criticism of Olenschlager's opera, Ludlum's Cave. Johann Ludwig Heiberg, the greatest analytical critic of whom Denmark can boast, remained Bagson's ardent admirer, and Heiberg's influential, though not always just, criticism of Olenschlager as a poet was no doubt called forth by Bagson's attack. Some years later, Henrik Hertz made Bagson his subject. In 1830 appeared Letters from Ghosts, Poetic Epistles from Paradise. Nobody knew that Hertz was the author. It was Bagson's voice from beyond the grave, Bagson's criticism upon the literature of 1830. It was one of the wittiest, and in versification one of the best books in Danish literature. Bagson's most important prose work is The Labyrinth, afterwards called The Wanderings of a Poet. It is a poetic description of his journeys, unique in its way, rich in impressions and full of striking remarks, written in a piquant, graceful, and easy style. As long as Danish literature remains, Bagson's name will be known, though his writings are now not widely read and are important chiefly because of their influence on the literary spirit of his own time. His familiar poem, There Was a Time When I Was Very Little, during the controversy with Olenschlager, was seized upon by Paul Muller, parodied, and changed into There Was a Time When Jens Was Much Bigger. Equally well known is his Ode to My Country, with the familiar lines, Alas, in no place is the thorn as tiny, Alas, in no place blooms as red a rose. Alas, in no place is their couch as downy, as where we little children found repose. A Cosmopolitan From the Labyrinth Forcer, a little nervous, alert, and piquant man, with gravity written on his forehead, purposecacity in his eye, and love around his lips, conquered me completely. I spoke to him of everything except his journeys, but the traveller showed himself full of unmistakable humanity. He seemed to me the cosmopolitan spirit, personified. It was as if the world were present when I was alone with him. We talked about his friend Jacobi, about the late king of Prussia, about the literature of Germany, and about the present Pole high standard of taste. I was much pleased to find in him the art critic I sought. He said that we must admire everything which is good and beautiful, whether it originates west, east, south, or north. The taste of the bee is the true one. Difference in language and climate, difference of nationality, must not affect my interest in fair and noble things. The unknown repels the animal, but should not repel the human creature. Suppose you say that Voltaire is animal in comparison with Shakespeare or Klopstock, or that they are animal in comparison with him. It is a blunder to demand pears of an apple tree, as it is ridiculous to throw away the apple because it is not a pear. The entire world of nature teaches us this aesthetic tolerance, and yet we have as little acquired it as we have freedom of conscience. We plant white and red roses in the same bed, but who puts the Messiah and the Henriette on the same shelf? He only who reads neither the one nor the other. True religion worships God. True taste worships the beautiful without regard of person or nation. German, French, Italian, or English, all the same, but nothing mediocre. I was flushed with pleasure. I gave him my hand. That may be said of other things than poetry, I said. Of all art, he answered. Of all that is human, we both concluded. Deplorable indolence, which clothes our mind in the first heavy cloak, ready to hand, so that all the sunbeams of the world cannot persuade us to throw it off, much less to assume another. 
The man who is exclusively a nationalist is a snail forever chained to his house. Psyche had wings given her for a never-ending eternal flight. We may not imprison her, be the cage ever so large. He considered that Lessing had wronged the great representative of the French language, and the remark of Claudius, Voltaire says he weeps, and Shakespeare does weep, appeared to him like the saying, much that is new and beautiful, as M. Arroy said, but it is a pity that the beautiful is not new and the new not beautiful, more witty than true. The English think that Shakespeare, as the Germans think that Lessing, really weeps. The French think the same of Voltaire, but the first weeps for the whole world, it is said, the last only for his own people. What the French call Le Nord is, to be sure, rather a large territory, but not the entire world. France calls whimpering in one case and blubbering in another what we call weeping. The general mistake is that we do not understand the nature of the people in the language in which and for whom the weeping is done. We must be English when we read Shakespeare, German when we read Klopstock, French when we read Voltaire, the man whose soul cannot shed its national costume and don that of other nations ought not to read, much less to judge their masterpieces. He will be looking at the moon by day and at the sun by night, and see the first without luster and the last not at all. Philosophy on the Heath From the Labyrinth Callard was a man of experience, taste, and knowledge. He told me the story of his life from beginning to end. He confided to me his principles and his affairs, and I took him to be the happiest man in the world. I have everything, he said, all that I have wished for or can wish for, health, riches, domestic peace, being unmarried, a tolerably good conscience, books, and as much sense as I need to enjoy them. I experience only one single want lack only one single pleasure in this world. But that one is enough to embitter my life and class me with other unfortunates. I could not guess what might yet be wanting to such a man under such conditions. It cannot be liberty, I said, for how can a rich merchant in a free town lack this? No, heaven save me. I neither would nor could live one single day without liberty. You do not happen to be in love with some cruel or unhappy princess. That is still less the case. Ah, now I have it, no doubt. Your soul is consumed with a thirst for truth, for a satisfactory answer to the many questions which are but philosophic riddles. You are seeking what so many brave men from Anaxagoras to Spinoza have sought in vain, the cornerstone of philosophy, the foundation of the structure of our ideas. He assured me that in this respect he was quite at ease. Then, in spite of your good health, you must be subject to that miserable thing. A cold in the head, I said. Uno minor, Jove divis, liver, honoratus, pulcher rex denic regum, presico sanus nisicum pituita molesta est. Chorus. When he denied this, too, I gave up trying to solve the meaning of his dark words. Oh, happiness! Of all earthly chimeras, thou art the most chimerical. I would rather seek dry figs on the bottom of the sea and fresh ones on this heath. I would rather seek liberty or truth itself, or the philosopher's stone, than to run after thee, most deceitful of lights, will-o'-the-wisp of our human life. I thought that at last I had found a perfectly happy and enviable man, and now, behold, Though I have not the ten-thousandth part of his wealth, though I have not the tenth part of his health, though I may not have a third of his intellect, although I have all the wants which he has not, and the one want under which he suffers, yet I would not change places with him. From this moment he was the object of my sincerest pity. But what did this awful curse prove to be? Listen and tremble. Of what use is it all to me? he said. Coffee, which I love more than all the wines of this earth, and more than all the women of this earth. 
coffee which i love madly coffee is forbidden me laugh who lists inasmuch as everything in this world viewed in a certain light is tragic it would be excusable to weep but inasmuch as everything viewed in another light is comic a little laughter could not be taken amiss only beware of laughing at the sigh with which my happy man pronounced these words for it might be that in laughing at him you laugh at yourself your father your grandfather your great-grandfather your great-great-grandfather and so on including your entire family as far back as adam if in laughing at such discontent you laugh in advance at your son your son's son son and so forth to the last descendant of your entire family this is a matter which i do not decide it will depend upon the road humanity chooses to take if it continues as it is going some coffee want or other will forever strew it with thorns had he said chocolate is forbidden me or tea or english ale or madeira or strawberries you would have found his misery equally absurd the great alexander is said to have wept because he found no more worlds to conquer the man who bemoans the loss of a world and the man who bemoans the loss of coffee are to my mind equally unbalanced and equally in need of forgiveness the desire for a cup of coffee and the desire for a crown the hankering after the flavor or even the fragrance of the drink and the hankering after fame are equally mad and equally human if history is to be believed adam possessed all the advantages and comforts all the necessities and luxuries a first man could reasonably demand lord of all living things and sharing his dominion with his beloved what did he lack among ten thousand pleasures the fruit of one single tree was forbidden him good-bye content and peace good-bye forever all his bliss i acknowledge that i should have yielded to the same temptation and he who does not see that this fate would have overtaken his entire family past and to come may have studied all things from the milky way in the sky to the milky way in his kitchen may have studied all stones plants and animals and all folios and quartos dealing therewith but never himself or man as we do not know the nature of the fruit which adam could not do without it may as well have been coffee as any other that it was pleasant to the eyes means no more than that it was forbidden every forbidden thing is pleasant to the eyes of what use is it all to me said adam looking around him in eden at the rising sun the blushing hills the light green forest the glorious waterfall the laden fruit trees and most beautiful of all the smiling woman of what use is it all to me when i dare not taste this coffee bean and of what use is it all to me said mr tower and looked around him on the lunberg heath coffee is forbidden me one single cup of coffee would kill me if it will be any comfort to you i said i may tell you that i am in the same case and you do not despair at times no i replied for it is not my only want if like you i had everything else in life i also might despair there was a time when i was very little there was a time when i an urchin slender could hardly boast of having any height oft i recall those days with feelings tender with smiles and yet the teardrops dim my sight Within my tender mother's arms I sported, I played at horse upon my grandsire's knee, sorrow and care and anger ill-reported, as little known as gold or Greek to me. The world was little to my childish thinking, and innocent of sin and sinful things. I saw the stars above me flashing, winking, to fly and catch them, how I longed for wings. I saw the moon behind the hills declining, and thought, oh were i on yon lofty ground i'd learn the truth for here there's no divining how large it is how beautiful how round in wonder too i saw god's son pursuing his westward course to ocean's lap of gold 
and yet at morn the east he was renewing with widespread rosy tints this artist old then turned my thoughts to god the father gracious who fashioned me and that great orb on high and the night's jewels decking heaven spacious from pole to pole its arch to glorify with childish piety my lips repeated the prayer learned at my pious mother's knee help me remember jesus i entreated that i must grow up good and true to thee then for the household did i make petition for kindred friends and for the townsfolk last the unknown king the outcast whose condition darkened my childish joy as he slunk past all lost all vanished childhood's days so eager my peace my joy with them have fled away i've only memory left possession meagre oh never may that leave me lord i pray end of section thirty six